Well, welcome to episode 33. Uh, this episode is on annuities and uh, payments for installment purchases. Uh, this particular episode I think you'll find interesting, uh, not only for business majors who will be talking about these formulas and using them in business courses, uh, but also just for the, the, the general student who wants to know more about uh, how, how they can uh, save money, how they determine payments on loans, and this sort of thing. Let's look at the, uh, at the list of objectives for this episode. Uh, first of all, we want to find out what is an annuity, and then we'll look at a, a formula for calculating the amount of an annuity. Then we'll look at what's called the present value of an annuity. You'll hear these terms in business courses. And we'll look at a formula for calculating the present value. And then finally, we'll look at how monthly payments are computed on a loan. Okay, well now, to begin with, when I say an annuity, what I mean is it's a sum of money that has been uh, collected from regular payments and interest that are put into an account. For example, you might, hear, uh, you might hear people talk about a retirement annuity. I have a retirement annuity, and every month I put in a certain amount of money into that. Uh, and so by way of the, my contributions and by the compounding of interest, hopefully it'll be a sizable amount by the time that I'm ready to retire. Let's look at the next graphic and we'll see this uh, sort of analyzed. An annuity is a sum of money that is the result of regular payments. And then I mentioned this example of retirement annuities. Uh, the regular payment that you make into an annuity is called the rent on that account. So I'll be using the letter R to represent that. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to uh, figure a for come up with a formula that will show us what will be the value of an annuity at, at the end of a certain amount of time if we know the interest rate, if we know how many payments are gonna be made into the account, how many periodic payments, and what those payments would be. Now, we have a formula on the next uh, graphic that we want to derive, but let's go ahead and look at this. A formula for the amount of an annuity. Now, A sub F, that refers to the final amount, A sub F, is equal to the rent times one plus I to the N minus one over I. I is the, is the uh, periodic interest rate, uh, R is the periodic payment that you make into the account, and N is the number of payments that you make into, it, into the account. Okay, uh, to derive that, I'm gonna go over here to the, to the whiteboard. And uh, to begin with, let's, uh, let me just remind you of a couple formulas that we've seen in the past that we wanna use. First of all, from the last episode, I want to use the formula for the sum of payments, um, for, the, for the sum of a geometric series. And that was uh, S sub n is equal to A times 1 minus R to the n over 1 minus R. Now we've just seen that formula recently. This is for the sum of the terms in a geometric series. Uh, another formula that I want to use um, is this one, and that says that if you, uh, if you deposit uh, some money, uh, say the principal, into a bank account, uh, and you want to figure out what is the amount that that will grow to, then the amount is the initial principal times one plus i to the n power. I think we ought to talk about this just a little bit because we'll be using this one a lot, and we saw this formula in uh, an episode, gosh, maybe 10 or 12 episodes back, so it's been a while since we've seen this. So let's just talk about this formula. Why don't I just leave it up here so we can refer to it. Um, suppose, first of all, that we deposit this amount of principal into a bank account that pays uh, I percent, pays a rate of I percent um, per period, and it's gonna be compounded for N periods. So we have N periods of compounding. then uh, the amount in the account after no periods have lapsed is just the amount that we put in the account because you have to wait until the end of the first period before any interest is added to that. The amount at the end of one period would be the principal plus the interest that's added onto it and the interest would be I times P. You take the interest rate times the principal and that would be the interest. And you know this is equal to P times one plus I. <coughs> Okay, now, if I wait two periods, then at the end of the second period, I will have the amount of money that I started that period with, this is how much money I entered the second period with, plus I'll have the interest on that money, which is I 
times P plus one plus I. In other words, this is how much money I started with in the second period, and then this is the interest rate times that amount of money, that's the interest. And you notice that if I factor out the common factor of uh, one, plus, one plus I, let's see, let's put that in front, I guess, uh, one plus I, then I'll be left with P plus IP. And I can factor a P out of that, so if I factor P out of that expression, then I have one plus I times one plus I again, and that's gonna give me P times one plus I to the second power. Well, I think we can see a pattern. Uh, if, if I wait zero periods, the amount of money in the account is just the principal that I've deposited. If I wait one period, it's P times one plus I. If I wait two periods, it's P times one plus I squared. And as a general rule, after n periods, I'll put a little subscript in on that, then it'll be P times one plus I to the n power. And in fact, in this case, that formula even applies because this is P times one plus I to the zero power. Uh, R1. Okay, now with this, with this formula in mind, let's look at how we could come up with a formula for the, for the uh, sum total, that is the annuity, given a certain rent. Okay, so let's assume that R represents our periodic payments, or the rent, into the account. Um, suppose I is the interest rate per period, so this is the rate per period. Now, by the way, that period doesn't have to be the end of a year. It could be a monthly payment or a weekly payment, but this would have to be the interest rate per that per period. And I'm going to be assuming that this is being compounded uh, according to this period. That is, to the period of the payment. So if we're making monthly payments, then it's being compounded monthly. If we're making, uh, um, if we're making uh, uh, semi-annual payments, then it's being compounded semi-annually. And let's suppose N represents the number of periods. So this is the number of periods uh, of compounding. And what I want to find is A sub P, well, excuse me, A sub F, which is the amount of the annuity. So I'm calling that A sub F for the final amount in that case. Okay, well, let's see. Um, suppose I were to make, um, suppose I were to make, uh, just to keep it simple, suppose I were to make only four, there were only four periods. So I would make four payments in the account. So, And that total would give me would give me a sub f. I'll, I'll put a sub f over here to give me a little room for that. Okay. Now um, let's see. In the first period, um, I would have in the first period I would my principal would be r, and it would be left in the account for n minus one periods after that. Now, by the way, I'm assuming that I'm making this payment at the end of the period, so there would be n minus one periods left over. That would be three periods left over for it to compound in. Now, the payment, or the, the second payment I make, if I make it at the end of the period, then it's only going to be in there for two more periods before um, I've come to my final amount, so one plus i squared. And then the payment I make in the third period is only going to be compounded for one period, so that'll be r times one plus i to the first power. And then the amount that I make in the third period uh, doesn't have a chance to do any compounding, so it's just r. So I have the rent here, 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 and here. But the one that I make earliest is the one that grows the most because it has more compounding attached to that. So if I figure the sum or, or the value of all of those rental payments, that is my uh, final amount. <clears throat> now, you know, if I turn this around, to me, this looks like a geometric series. And it looks to me like um, uh, the first term A is R, and it looks like the common ratio is, the little r, is 1 plus i. 
Okay, now let's go to our summation formula for uh, a finite geometric series. You remember, um, I could write that as a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. That's the formula that we derived in the last episode. So in this case, for a, I'll put r. And for little r, I'll put 1 plus i. And in this case, that's going to be to the uh, fourth power, because I'm adding up four terms, over 1 minus 1 plus i. Now, if I reduce this, that's going to be r times 1 minus 1 plus i to the fourth over, uh, let's see, what is this going to reduce to b, class? 1 minus 1 plus i. How much is that? i. Uh, it's going to be a negative <coughs> i, actually. You see, 1 minus 1 minus i, that's going to be a negative i. And now, just to take care of that negative, why don't we multiply top and bottom by negative 1? And when I multiply by negative 1 here, I'll just reverse the order. So this says r times the quantity 1 plus i to the fourth minus 1 all over i. Now, this is the formula when you make four payments. How do you think I would write that formula if I were going to make n payments instead of four? How do you think it would change? Well, I tell you, it, what happens is I just change that exponent. So if I'm making n payments into an annuity, then the formula is r times 1 plus i to the nth power minus 1 all over i. OK, let's look at the next graphic, and I think we'll see that formula. <coughs> Okay, now here we have a formula for the amount of an annuity, and this is the formula that we just derived on the board. Uh, a sub f is r times 1 plus i to the n minus 1 all over i, where each of those terms is explained again. Let's go to the next example, and we'll see how we can apply this. It says, what will be the value of an annuity that consists of quarterly payments of $100 for 20 years at an annual interest rate of 6% compounded quarterly? Okay, well, first of all, class, let me ask you this. In 20 years, how many quarters will there be? How many quarterly payments will be made? 80. The 80 payments, sure, because there are four quarters in every year. So we'll have, we'll have 80 payments. So 80 payments of $100. So that means we're putting in, actually, uh, $8,000 of our money. Now, we would expect that due to compounded interest that the value of the annuity is going to be considerably more than $8,000, but at least we have a kind of a, a lower bound on how much will be in this account. So now let's try figuring the exact value of this annuity, and I'll use the formula that we have just, that we have just presented here. So we have A sub F is R times 1 plus I to the N power minus 1 all over I. Now, the rent is $100. That's the amount of the payment. Uh, the interest rate is not 6%, because this has to be the interest rate per quarter. So I'll have to divide that by 4. Uh, so what is 6% divided by 4? Um, one and a half. Percent. One and a half percent, yeah. So that'll be 0 0.015 that I'll put in here for 1 plus i. And I'll raise this to n. Now, n is the number of payments, the number of periods. And we said that would be 80. So it's not 20 years, but it's 80 quarters, minus 1. And then we divide by i. And i, again, is 0 0.015. Well, I can, let's say I better put square brackets around that portion. Now, I can reduce this a little bit by calling this 100 times the quantity 1.015 to the 80th power minus 1, all divided by 0 0.015. Okay, so I'd like to carry out that calculation on my calculator. And let me just lay this right in the middle here. If you can zoom in on my calculator, I'm going to be, I'm going to be computing that amount. <coughs> okay, so first of all, we said that was going to be 100 times the quantity, um, 1.015 uh, raised to the 80th power minus 1. Close parentheses. Now, I'm going to divide that amount by 0 0.015. And we get a total of 15,000. 
$271. And uh, you see that is more than the 8000 that we put in initially. In fact, our money is just about doubled if you look at the actual face value of the money we put in. Um, we, we now have a little over $15,000. This is at the end of 20 years. Now you may say, well, gee, Dennis, that's not really that much, but you know we're only putting in $100 per quarter, so we're not, uh, we're not really uh, uh, putting enough money in there to make that grow too rapidly. Let's go to another problem, another example, <coughs> about the Jeffersons. What does it take? Okay, in this problem it says the Jeffersons plan to retire in 40 years and have decided they need a retirement annuity of $600,000 um, at the end of that time. What payment should they make into this annuity if these accounts typically pay 4.8% interest and let's assume monthly compounding? Okay, well let's see, if we come to the, to the green screen here, we're going to be using the same formula and that is, once again, that A sub F, the final amount of the annuity, is R times uh, 1 plus I to the nth power minus 1 all over I. Uh, by the way, I should mention to you that when you have, when we cover this material on the, on the final exam, because this is the only place that you'll, that you'll see this, um, that I'll give you all of these formulas. Uh, we're going to have two other formulas that are come up that are going to come up in this episode, and I'll give you these formulas. Since these are rather specific to business majors, uh, I won't expect you to memorize them. Okay, now you see this time the question is how much should the Jeffersons be depositing in their account every month? So we're looking for the rent, and because I'm now looking for the rent, it means I have to know what is the final amount, and we said that should be six hundred thousand dollars. So I'll put 600,000 over here on the left uh, equals R times, now let's see, we were assuming that the interest rate was 4.8%, that was the annual interest rate, and so monthly compounding, let's see, 4.8%, if I divide that by 12, that's going to be 0.04% uh, per month. So here I'll put 1.004, that's the 1 plus I, and I'll raise this to, let's see now, we, this was for 40 years. How many months are in 40 years? Uh, let's see, I think that'll be 480 compounding periods or months. And I'll divide it by 1, or rather subtract off of 1, and then divide it by 0 0.004. You know, let me write that 480 a little bit clearer. I think it's probably a little hard to, to read on the camera. So this is 1.004 raised to the 480th power. Uh, so what I'll need to do here is to solve for R. Well, it looks like R is going to be 600,000 times 0 .004 divided by the quantity in this bracket. So 600,000 times 0 0.004 divided by 1.004 raised to the 480th power minus 1. And we want to figure out how much that is. Now, you know, if I want to get this down to the exact penny, when I go to round off to the nearest penny, I'm going to round up, because if I round down, they theoretically won't have, they won't have $600,000. They'll come up just a few cents short, so I'll be rounding up. And also, I'm assuming that there's the same interest rate for 40 years. So, um, that's one of the assumptions that we've made here. Now, if you can zoom in on my calculator, uh, I'm having to lay this right over the numbers, but that's what I'm going to that's what I'm going to compute. And this will be six hundred thousand times um, point zero zero four, and then I have to divide by. Uh, I have to divide by a difference. Let me just show you. I have to divide by this difference. I'm going to put this in. I'm going to put that in parentheses. Um, so parentheses 1.0004 uh, raised to the 480th power because there are 480 compounding periods in in 40 years uh, minus one close parentheses and I get 414 dollars and 15 cents, but I'm going to round that up to 16 cents because 15 cents means they're going to come up a little bit short, so we'll say 16. So 
I mean, we're, we're getting a little technical here, but around $414. So we'll say this ends up being $414.16 is what they should put in monthly if they want this to become $600,000 at that interest rate. Now, if we go back to that graphic, let's look at one other, that the, the last part of the question. Let's go back to what does it take. Um, what if the account pays only 3% and what if it pays only 6%? So I tell you what, on my screen here, I'm going to copy this answer. And uh, we said that at 4.8%, the rent would be 41416. Okay, that's what we've just computed here. Now, if I change the percent to 3%, what will I have to change in this expression right here? It'll still be $600,000, but what, will I, what, what would I put here on the bottom? What will be I? Now, this is supposed to be the monthly interest rate. Well, if you take 3% and divide by 12, that's going to be one-fourth of 1% which is 0 0.0025. That's what I need to put for my monthly interest rate. So I'll put that right here. 0 0.0025. And while I'm at it, I'll put that up here. 1.0025. Now, what do you think is going to happen to the rent on the account? Do you think it's going to get larger or smaller? Larger. It's going to get larger because they're not compounding interest uh, as rapidly, so they're going to have to make bigger payments. Now let's go back and calculate that one. So if we zoom in, then once again this is going to be 600,000 uh, times 0 .0025 uh, divided by the quantity 1.0025 raised to the 480th power uh, minus one, close parentheses, and now we get six hundred and forty-seven dollars and ninety-one cents. Six forty-seven ninety-one. Okay, if we if we look then at at the at, at compare these results, then it looks like their monthly payment has gone up by more than fifty percent. They've gone from a little over four hundred to almost uh, six hundred and fifty dollars. So it's gone up by a little more than 50% when the interest rate drops to about 60% of what it was initially. Okay, now the last question that I asked in that graphic is what happens if the interest rate had been 6%? And I tell you what, I don't think I'll work that one out because I think you see the procedure. What I'll do is have to change uh, this to be one half of 1% per month. That'll be 1.005 and I'll divide by 0.005. And of course, this will end up being the smallest amount of all. Did any of you compute that? Have any of you computed that at your seats? Uh, some of the people in here were working on the calculator, so that maybe they'd gotten that answer. Um, OK, so I'll leave that one open. But it'll certainly be less than uh, $414. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this isn't uh, perhaps even under $300, what that would be. OK. Um, well, let's see. Let's go to the next graphic. Okay, this one says, how long must she suffer? Now, we're talking about Heather here. Heather has a hankering for a hybrid. Now, you know, I, when I say a hybrid, I'm referring to these uh, uh, dual-powered automobiles that run on gas and, uh, and uh, well, they, they run on gasoline and they run on electricity. So uh, Heather refuses to, to uh, pay interest to anyone. Uh, don't ask, that's uh, just the way she is. So Heather figures she can save $350 each month in a savings account that pays 4.5% interest per year, compounded daily. How long will it take her to save $30,000? Well, you see, uh, this time we're given the total amount of the annuity that she wants to collect, $30,000. But we also know the rent on the account is $350. What we don't know is the number of payments that have to be made. So we'll be solving for little n. OK, well, if we come back to the green screen here, once again, here's our formula. You know, I, I think you're going to be, in this section, you'll be using this formula enough that you will just know the formula, even though the fact that I said I would give it to you on the exam. Um, so once again, we have this formula. And we're looking for n this time, the number of payments. 
So she wants $30,000. Actually, I don't know how much a hybrid costs, so I just pick that number in this problem. And uh, she can save $350 a month, which sounds like a nice, tidy sum. In fact, you might say, well, gee, why doesn't she just go ahead and buy it now? But why isn't she buying it now? Interest? She didn't want to pay interest. Yeah, don't ask. That's just the way she is, you see. Okay, so she's going to put this money into an account. And uh, the account paid, let's see, 4.5%. Um, let's see, that was 4.5%, but it's compounded daily. And uh, so, you know, she's making her payments monthly. So what I'm thinking we should do is to say, why don't we just assume this is compounded monthly because the compounded interest rates are very close to one another, as we saw a few episodes ago. So even though the money isn't being compounded monthly, let's take this to be the interest rate compounded monthly. And if I take a twelfth of that, let's see, 45 over 12, if I divide top and bottom by 3, that's going to be 1.5 over 4%. And then if I divide by 4, that's going to be 0 0.0375%. So I've divided by 12, and this is the interest rate I get per month. So this will be 1.00... Uh, whoops, I have one too many zeros in there. That should be 0 0.3. Uh, so 1.00375 raised to the power of n, we don't know n, minus 1, divided by 0 0.00375. Well now, wait a minute, how am I going to solve for n in a problem like this? What would, what would you do to solve for n? We'll have to get it a, that term alone and then use logarithms. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to use logarithms on this problem. So this is going to be 30,000 multiplied by 0 0.00375. While we're at it, let's go ahead and divide by the 350. And that's going to equal 1.00375 raised to the nth power minus 1. So if I add the 1 on the other side, 30,000 times 0 0.00375 over 350 plus 1. And that's 1.00375 to the n. Okay, so here I have to use logarithms. So this, this is a good opportunity for us to review what a logarithm can do. Um, on my calculator, I have a log base 10 and a natural log button. I can use either one of those. I don't see that anyone's more appropriate in this problem. So let's say we take a common log on both sides. So I'll take the log of the quantity 30,000. Uh, times 0 0.00375 over 350 uh, plus 1. And I'll take the log of this expression. Now, you remember when you take the log of an exponential, you can bring the exponent out in front times the log of 1.00375. So to solve for n, I think I just have enough room here to write this. I'm going to divide by that logarithm over here. So I'm going to divide by the log of 1.00375, and then I can remove that from the other side. Okay, so we're going to have to go to our calculator again and compute this. And uh, I see everybody in the class is already working on it, so let me try to catch up with them. If you'll zoom in on my calculator, um, I'm going to take uh, the log of the quantity, 30,000 times point, uh, zero, zero, 0.00375, and then I'm going to divide that by uh, 350. That was the, the amount, that was the rent on the account. And then I'm going to add 1 and close parentheses. So that's the logarithm, or that's the numerator, which is that logarithm. And then I have to divide by the logarithm that was on the bottom. And that's the log of 1.00375. And this should give me n. And I get 74 and, well, about 74 and a half. Now, you remember, this is measured in months. This is the number of months it's going to take her to save that much money. So either she's going to save this in 74 months or 75 months. 74, she'll come out a little short. So we'll say this ends up being... 
75 months. Now let me move my calculator off the screen here and you'll see that I'm going to round up because if I round down she won't quite have the $30,000. So if we go to the green screen, yeah, so I'm putting in n equals 75 and what I just computed was this, was this ratio over here. And this is a good application for using, using logarithms. It's going to take her about 75 months. How many years is that, 75 months? About six and a quarter years. Yeah, it's six years and three months. Six years and three months. So it's going to take Heather quite a while to save up this amount of money at $350 uh, per month. Okay, now the other question, if we go back to that graphic of how long must Heather suffer, uh, what, if, what if she can make payments of $450 a month? Let's see, when I work this out before class, I think the number ends up being around 59 or 60 months. So she can save about a year if she raises her payments by $100. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to work that out. But if you come back to the green screen, I think it would be very easy to adjust this. You notice all we'd have to do is put in 450, where I have 350, because we'd only be changing the rent on the account. So if you just put a 450 right there, you can calculate that. And I think you get about five years in that case. Okay, uh, now let's look at a different sort of problem. This is referred to as the present value of an annuity. So let's go to the next graphic. Um, the present value of an annuity. This says a lump sum investment that provides regular withdrawals, such as, a, say, a trust fund or something, uh, of a fixed amount and on a regular basis is called the present value of an annuity. Uh, this is the present value of the regular payments that will be drawn onto the account, on the account. Okay, so for example, if you put a lump sum of money in a savings account and you decide you want to take a regular amount out of that um, for a certain number of, for a certain length of time, uh, then the amount that you put in is called the present value of the annuity, whereas the value of all those things compounded at the other end would be the, would be the final annuity. Okay, so what we need to do is find a formula that will compute the present value of an annuity. In fact, well, we have that on the, first, on the next graphic here. Let me show you the formula, and then we're going to derive it up here at the board. So a formula for the present value of an annuity. I, I'm calling that A sub P for present value of the annuity. Uh, the present value is equal to the rent, which would be the, the regular withdrawals you make on the account, times 1 minus 1 plus I to the negative N exponent. Don't overlook that negative in there, all over i. So let's see where that comes from. Now, um, what we're assuming then is that we put some money into a bank account. And then we're going to take in payments out of that, in regular payments, uh, and the amount of r dollars. So we'll be withdrawing the same amount every time. Uh, and it's going to be compounded at an interest rate of i. Uh, the interest rate is i per unit, per, uh, per, per period, uh, and uh, then we have N payments, each one for that period. Okay, so how would I figure out what's the present value in that account? Well, let's see. Uh, let's just keep things simple. Suppose I were going to just withdraw four uh, payments. So I'd be withdrawing R and R and R and R. Now, where does that money come from? Well, of course, it's somehow in this account. But I have to have a certain amount of money to cover that payment. I'll call that A sub 1. <coughs> and then I'll have to have a certain amount of money extra to cover this payment, A sub 2. And then a certain amount of money to cover the next payment, and some money to cover the fourth payment. Now, let's see. Um, if, if this fourth payment represents the last payment that I'm going to withdraw, then this is probably the smallest one of these four amounts, because this has the most time to compound, whereas this one only gets to compound for one period. If I put the money in the account and then I wait one period and then I start withdrawing the money immediately, then this guy only compounds one time. This compounds for two periods, for three periods, and for four periods. Okay, now I'm going to use the formula that we derived earlier, A equals P times 1 plus I to the N. That's my fundamental compounding formula. And I figure this is the amount I've deposited in the account to cover the first withdrawal, which is one period later. So a sub 1 times 1 plus i to the first power 
is going to have to give me an amount of R dollars at the end of that period so that I can withdraw that. So if I solve for A1, A1 is equal to R <coughs> over 1 plus I. Okay, so I know how much that's going to have to be, R divided by 1 plus I. What about, better put a box around that, what about the, uh, the, the second amount? Now this is going to be sitting in the account for two periods before I withdraw it for the second rent payment. So I'll have to deposit A sub 2. It's going to be the, in the account for two periods. And at the end of two periods, it's going to have a value of R dollars so that I can withdraw that, that money. So A sub 2 is R divided by 1 plus I squared. Let's put that one right below it. A sub 2 is R times 1 plus I squared. Well, I think you can see the pattern here. A sub 3 is going to be R over 1 plus I cubed. And A sub 4 is going to be R over 1 plus I to the fourth power. So if I add those four quantities together, that's how much money I need in the account to cover those four payments. So let's just write that down up here. <clears throat> the present value that I need to deposit is going to have to be R over 1 plus I plus R over 1 plus I squared plus R over 1 plus I cubed plus R over 1 plus I to the fourth power. That's how we computed those, uh, those quantities. Now, of course, if, there, if I were going to make 100 payments out of this account, I'd write down 100 terms like that, but I'd just pick four to keep it brief so you could kind of see what's going on. Now, it looks to me like this is a geometric series. And for the geometric series, it looks like the first term, A, is 1 over 1 plus I. And it looks like the multiplier, what I multiply by every time, is 1 over 1 plus i. And I'm going to write that as 1 plus i to the negative 1 power. It'll take up a little bit less space. And therefore, the sum of after these, of these four terms is what I'm calling a sub p. And my formula for this is a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. <coughs> So for A, I'll substitute R over 1 plus I. And I'll multiply by 1 minus, now let's see, R raised to the nth power, that's going to be 1 plus I to the negative N. 1 plus I to the negative N power divided by 1 minus R. And for R, I'm going to write it as this fraction, 1 over 1, 1 plus I. Okay, now to simplify this, I think what I'll do is multiply on top and bottom by 1 plus i. 1 plus i, 1 plus i. And you see what that's going to do is it's going to cancel out this denominator, and it's going to cancel out this denominator. So I think this will give me r times, because this is now canceled, 1 plus, no, 1 minus, uh, 1 plus i to the negative n power over... Now when I multiply here, I'll get 1 plus i minus 1. 1 plus, 1 plus i minus 1, which reduces to just be little i. So I'll just erase that and put i right there. Now this gives me the present value of the account. Oh, by the way, this should have been for a power of 4 because I was adding up four terms. But in general, if there had been n terms there, then I should be putting an n in that expression. I guess I was thinking of the ultimate formula that I'm going to derive. So that's going to be an n. And if I were adding up those four terms, I'd just put a negative 4 right there. Now let's go back to that graphic, and I think you'll see that that's the formula that we've just derived. Yes, a sub p is r times 1 minus the quantity 1 plus i to the negative n power all over i. Okay, well, let's go to an application of this formula and uh, try solving a present value problem. So if we can go to the, the next example. Here we are. It says, what sum of money should be deposited if we plan to make monthly withdrawals of $1,000 each month? Gee, I wish I could. Uh, for the next 10 years, assume the account pays 7% interest compounded monthly, and these are monthly withdrawals. 
Okay, now the formula that we want to use, the formula that we've just derived, says that uh, a sub p is r times 1 minus the quantity 1 plus i to the negative n power all over i. Okay, so what do we know here? What is the rent on this account? Uh, well, we're wanting to make $1,000 withdrawals, so that'll be the rent, $1,000 times uh, 1 minus the uh, 1 plus i. Now the interest rate, this is 7.2% uh, per year. If I divide that by 12, if you divide that by 12, what would you get? Let's do it right below here. Uh, 7.2 divided by 12. You know 12 goes into 72 six times. So that'll be 0 0.6. So this is 0 0.6 tenths of a percent per month. So I'll be adding on six-tenths of a percent. That'll be 1.006, and uh, this is raised to the negative n power. Now, what is n? Well, we're making monthly withdrawals for 10 years. How many months will that be? 120. 120, so I'll put a negative 120 power on that, and then I'll divide by 0 0.006. So if I compute that amount, uh, that is how much I need to put in the account now to allow me to do this. So let's go to the calculator. And we'll enter 1,000 times the quantity 1 minus 1.006 raised to the 120 and, oh, I should have put my negative in there first. You know, there are some calculators where you have to enter the negative uh, ahead of time, and this is one of them. So I'll insert here a negative. Okay, so negative 120, and then close parentheses, and then I have to divide that by 0 0.006. And this gives me an amount of $85,366.57. In other words, uh, Roughly $85,400 should be plenty, but well, let's write down that exact value there. Uh, $85,366.57. Now, how much money are we actually withdrawing from the account? 120 payments of $1,000 each. How much is that? 120 payments or withdrawals of $1,000. $120,000. So let's just compare these two. We are withdrawing 120000 but we put in only 85000 and that's due to all the compounding that occurs along the way. So we don't have to put in that full amount to be able to withdraw $1,000 a month. Okay, we have another example, our last example. And you know what? You are a winner. Yes, you are a winner. Congratulations. You've just won a million dollars in the lottery. Now the money will be paid in equal installments of fifty thousand dollars every or for every year for twenty years, or you can accept a smaller lump sum payment right now if you prefer. Now assume that you can expect to get eight percent interest compounded annually. Actually, that's pretty high to get expect to get eighty eight percent interest certainly right now uh, for the next twenty years. If they offered you six hundred thousand dollars now, would you accept it? Well, of course, there are lots of reasons for accepting a lump sum now or lots of reasons for spreading this out uh, other than financial reasons. Um, you may need the money right now or you may not expect to live for 20 years and you may want to be able to spend all that money on your, for yourself and maybe not, for, not by your heirs. Um, so for whatever reason, you may decide to take a lump sum or you may decide to take the equal installments. But you notice that 20 years... $50,000 a year, that is a million dollars that you would receive, but you don't get it all at once. So I think what we should do is figure out what is the present value of these $50,000 payments every year for 20 years and find out if the present value is more or less than 600, and then we can make our decision as to whether we'd take all the money now or not. Okay, so let's come to the green screen and try solving this present value problem. Okay, once again, our formula is the present value is the rent times 1 minus 1 plus i raised to the negative n power all over i. So um, it's this fundamental formula now that we'll, we'll be using once again. 
Now, what would you say is the rent in this case on this account? $50,000. $50,000, yeah, that's going to be the payment we're going to be making, or we're going to be receiving. So the rent is $50,000. Um, let's see now, what is the interest rate? Now, we were assuming that we could get 8% per year compounded annually, and these are annual payments, so I will be 8%. So this will be 1 minus 1.08 raised to the negative... Uh, now let's see, annual payments for 20 years, that'll be a negative 20 power, divided by 0 0.08. Okay, now if we calculate that, let's see what we get. Has anybody calculated it yet at your seats? I guess not. Let's, let's just try that, calculating it right here. $50,000 times the quantity 1 minus 1.08 raised to the negative 8 power, close parentheses. Oh, excuse me, there should be negative 10 power. Let's back up here and change that. The negative uh, 10 power, close parentheses, oh, negative 20. Negative 20 power, we're getting there. Close parentheses, uh, divided by 0 0.08. And we get $490,000 and 907. So let's round it off and say it's about $491. So it's approximately $491,000. And you know, this is at, this is at compounding at 8% annually. That's, that's relatively high. You might be able to do that, but I don't think you could do that necessarily continuously through um, 20 years unless you invest in something with a fixed return. And I don't, I don't think, it, I think that would be hard to find right now. So probably in the long run, you wouldn't, ac you wouldn't actually have even this present value if you were going to invest it. So uh, from a strictly dollar point of view, should you accept the $600,000 now? Let's go back and look at the problem one more time. You see at the very end it says, if they offered you $600,000 now, would you accept it? Now, if you're strictly interested in getting the most money, should you accept the 600000 or the $50,000 payments every year? 50000 payments. Well, let's see. What did we figure the present value to be? Let's come back to the green screen. The present value of those payments is less than half a million dollars. Or would you take $600,000 now, and then you could invest that if you wanted at the same rate of 8%. So it looks like $600,000 is the more attractive offer. This is less than half a million dollars is the, is the actual present value of those $50,000 payments and they would give you $600,000 in cash. So this has a higher value. What you do with this money is up to you. You could put this in the bank and you could draw interest on it and every year you could take out more than $50,000 a year. Uh, Matt? Also, for what about not counting inflation or deflation, is 20 years from now, would a $50,000 payment be worth as much? Well, you see, I think that's actually taken into account in the compounded taken. interest. Yeah, so the fact that you're getting compound interest on that money means that that, that, that money's, you're, you're going to get more payments out of it. Um, so you may only be getting $50,000 per year, but you're getting 20 years of payments out of that due to the compound interest. So hopefully the compounding will counteract inflation. Uh, you know, another problem is if you take the $600,000 now, you'd probably have to pay income tax on all of that. Whereas if you take these smaller payments of $50,000, uh, you wouldn't have to, you'd only have to pay interest or uh, income tax on $50,000 every year for uh, 20 years. So that's something to take into account, too, that we haven't mentioned here. So perhaps with income tax included, maybe this is the better deal because the taxes may eat up so much of that 600000 Okay, well, let's go to the next graphic, and I think there's a, our, our third formula and last formula for this episode. Okay, now, here we have a formula for installment buying. Uh, suppose, for example, you take out a loan and you have monthly payments to repay the loan. For example, if you're buying a car or a house, uh, here's a formula that will calculate your periodic payments. And it says that the rent, or the payment, is I times A sub P, the present value, which is the amount that you borrowed, divided by 1 minus 1 plus I to the negative N. Now that formula looks a little complicated, but actually it's just a, it's just a, a variation of our previous formula. If you come to the green screen, I can show you why. 
Here's our present value formula. A sub P equals R, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm going to solve for R in this formula. And if I solve for R, I'm going to have I times A sub P, the present value, divided by 1 minus the quantity 1 plus I to the negative n power. Now, you see, if you purchase a car, and let's say that car sells for $20,000, that's the present value of the loan. That uh, if you borrow $20,000, that's the present value that the bank or, what, or the lender is giving up at that moment. Now, you have to make payments to pay back that amount. So that is like, uh, that, that, that would be equivalent to saying, if you took this money, A sub P, put it in a bank account, and you made these regular withdrawals, and you, uh, and you had just enough money to make all of the payments on the car, that would be in payments, then uh, that would be the rent on that present value account. So what I've done is I've solved for R and uh, just made up this variation of the formula. So for example, if you, if you um, bought a $20,000 car, and if the interest rate per month were, um, let's say, 0.007%, uh, and then if I divide by 1 minus 1.007, and let's say we're going to pay this off in 60 months, so I'd put a negative 60 there. If I calculate that, this would tell you how much your monthly payment would be, although there'd probably be some other charges included with this, like uh, uh, loan charges and so forth. But, uh, but uh, this would be basically the, the amount you'd have to repay per month. Let's go to the next graphic, and we'll see an application of this formula. This is Heather's dilemma. You remember Heather has a hankering to buy, to buy a hybrid. Uh, now, um, what we found out was that if she saves $350 per month, it'll take her about 75 months to save up $30,000 to buy this car. Now, let's consider this alternative. Uh, what if she were to make a $1,500 down payment and finance the balance at 9% for the next 75 months? what would her payments be, not including the loan charges? Well, let's come to our form formula and find out. Now, let's see, it's a $30,000 car, but she's paying $1,500 up front, so that says that A sub P is only gonna be 28,500. So we have I times A sub P over um, one minus the quantity one plus I to the negative N. Okay, now uh, let's see, the amount she's financing is $28,500. And the interest rate was 9% uh, per year. So per month, I'd have to divide that by 12, and that would be 0 0.0075. And then I'll divide that by 1 minus 1.0075. And this was for 75 months, so that'll be a minus 75. The reason I chose 75 months to repay the loan is uh, that's how long it was going to take her to save up this money. Now let's see how much her payments would be. So I'm going to go to the calculator. And this will be 0 .0075 times 28,500 divided by the quantity 1 minus 1.0075 raised to the negative 75 power, and I'll close parentheses, equals. And I have $498, Let, let's say it's $500 to round it off. It's about $500. Okay, so what have we found out here? If she were saving her money into an account to pay cash down the line, she'd be paying $350 into the account for 75 months. On the other hand, if she makes a small down payment, then her payments would be around, uh, remember her down payment was $1,500, then uh, she would have to, um, uh, she'd have to make payments of around $500 a month to pay off the car in 75 months. So you notice this has increased dramatically, and the difference is if you're making this car payment of $500, you're having to pay all the compound interest that lies ahead. On the other hand, if you're saving $350, you are collecting the compound interest rather than spending the compound interest. So there's a drastic difference here in what you would have to save now to buy the car later and what you'd pay now to have the car now. Of course, the difference is uh, with the $500 payment, 
you, you're able to drive the car right now. The $350 payment, you're having to wait over six years before you can purchase the car with cash. Okay, so there's a, that's the distinction between the payment now, um, the, the savings payment now, and the loan payment right now. Okay, well, let's see. We've had three formulas in this episode. Let me just remind you how they go. The first one was to find the value of an annuity. Then we found the present value of an annuity. And then we had the installment loan uh, payment on, on a loan. Now, those three formulas, once again, will be given to you on, a, uh, on, the, on the final exam. And uh, so you should only need to know how to use it. Be sure to bring your calculator with you. You can use a calculator on that last exam. And um, I will see you next time. You know, I thought we'd take a chance to visit with a couple students in the class. Uh, this is Stephen over here on the far side from me on, on your left. And then this is Matt on my right. You know, we've been filming two episodes a day. Uh, Stephen's been in every episode, I think. And Matt comes for the second episode because he has another class that he attends. Uh, Stephen, what is your major, or do you have a major right now? I'm actually undeclared right now. You're, you're undeclared? Mm -hmm. Matt, what about you? Undeclared. Undeclared. Now, you know, both of these fellows have actually had college algebra from me already. Matt had college algebra, was in my college algebra class about, what, a year ago or so? Uh, a little over a year. A little over a year. And Stephen was in my college algebra class last semester. So if you see that these guys seem to give a lot of good answers, it's because they've actually seen this material before. But I invited them to sit in on this class. Um, what other courses are you taking this semester, Stephen? What are you taking? Uh, I'm taking a computer science course in C++, uh -huh. and I'm also taking a statistics course. Oh, really? Yeah. And an English course in uh, technical writing. In technical writing, yeah. And Matt, what about you? What else are you taking? Uh, calculus, Information Systems 1120 intro, and also taking uh, Modern Philosophy. Oh, Modern Philosophy. Oh, very good. Now, uh, let's see, Matt here says he's taking uh, Calculus 1. You know, to take the regular engineering calculus, you need to have college algebra and then trigonometry. So you had trigonometry after you had the college algebra course. And uh, Stephen, I think, may take calculus in the future. But, uh, you know, this raises a good point. For those of you at home who plan on taking the regular calculus sequence, Math 1210, 1220, and uh, 2210, you need to take college algebra and trigonometry both before you go into those courses. If you're a business major, if you're a biology major, uh, and you're planning on taking what they call Math 1100, Intro to Calculus, you don't need to have trigonometry, just Math 1050, College Algebra, and then you can go right into those courses next semester, or that course. Uh, we'll see you next time for episode 34. <laughs>